Shalom, and thank you for listening to sermons from Tikvat Israel, a Messianic synagogue in the heart of Richmond, Virginia. Listening to the podcast is great, but we would love to meet you in person. All are welcome, and that includes you. So if you want the full experience, please join us Saturday mornings at 10 a.m. for our worship service at the corner of Arthur Ashe Boulevard and Grove in the historic synagogue across from the art museum. Can't make it in person? No problem. We are also live streaming on YouTube. Contact our administrator at tikvatdirector at gmail.com for the link during the week or contact us on our website tikvatisrael.com. There, you can also support the ministry, learn more about Messianic Judaism, and find helpful resources. May Hashem bless you through the hearing of His Word. In the course of my preaching, I have asked if a hot dog can be a sandwich. And I have encouraged us to think of the golden calf incident and the surrounding instructions with the tabernacle to be like a sandwich. So clearly something is going on while I'm writing these sermons. What can I say? I like a nice sandwich. Why is that? You know, and another thing, why do I ask questions all the time? Sometimes you'll ask me a question and I'll respond with a question. Why do I do that? And why do I make jokes that are only funny to like 15% of the people that are present? Oh, that one you like, okay, all right. (laughs) Well, some of this is explained by Jewish culture. Now, you know, I'm from Richmond, born and raised, and even though there are about 10,000 Jews in the greater Richmond area, not all of them come to Tikvot yet. No, wait, that's not what I meant to say. Even though there is a large Jewish population in Richmond, sometimes it's hard to find good Jewish food. Have you noticed that? You can do it, but it's, it's a little tough. There's something about going up north to a nice Jewish deli. It just puts me at ease, right? It just makes me comfortable. I don't know, I don't know what it is. It's like I'm with my people and I've got the food and you know, I can pray for people while I'm noshing quietly, you know, like, oh Lord, you know, get them, you know? Um, so that's, uh, I just really like it. So here's a picture of me and my son at his first Jewish deli up north. This is called the Kibbutz Room. We took a little road trip and you can see in the background, what is that? That's the pickle bar, all right? Did anyone bring extra pickles for today's oneg? If so, oh, all right. You get not a Torah point, but a culture point. Congratulations, Marge. Okay, and don't worry, my wife had a good time too. And she did not approve, she did not approve that picture, so let's just take it down before she, take it down, take it down. Okay, thank you. All right, see, everyone likes a nice sandwich. (laughs) Don't tell her. (laughs) I love you. (laughs) But are these, you know, kosher delis, are they really kosher? Or are they just kosher style? Is it culture? Is it covenant? What is it? And why do they bring me so much comfort? Now, we'll come back to food, don't worry, as much as I love food. But I want to talk for a moment about culture. Culture isn't just food, of course, but culture is how we do things. And that includes things like humor. Now, if we're talking Jewish humor or Jewish culture, it can be sometimes self-deprecating, usually based on our common experience, our common experience of suffering. As Yenta put it from the show Fiddler on the Roof, we suffer, we suffer, we suffer in silence. Actually, my mom used to say that all the time growing up. So this was, you know, part of our culture. Jewish culture is not a monolithic either. It's, it's different in different places. For example, in Israel, it's, in some ways it's different. In some ways it's similar to American Jewish culture. But in Israel, it's like everyone is uh, mishpucha, right? Or they would say mishpacha, right? Everyone is family. So strangers in Israel will give you advice, okay? Don't, don't. Don't do that. What, what are you doing? All right? And there's a, also there's like an urgency and a hardiness to the culture, right? Uh, so they don't do a lot of small talk because, you know, they get to the point. You know, there's, you know, bombs flying overhead. You got you to gotta do what you came to do, right? Be, be direct. So I'm going to tell a little story about Israeli Jewish culture. Now, take into account, I was much younger, okay, and more let's say expressive in public than I am now. Now I'm a little bit more, you know, mature in public as, as you all know. So why are you laughing? 
Just let me tell this. All right. So, so, so anyway, I was, I was in a bookstore and I was reading a children's book out loud uh, joyfully. And I was so happy because it was in Hebrew. I could read it and I could actually understand some of it. So I was making joyful noises. I was like, yeah, I got this. And there was a, a little boy who was probably about eight years old, somewhat nearby, you know, lots of people there. But he was like a little taken aback by my joy and my reading out loud. And I was like, I understand this. You know, he's looking at me weird. So I said, al tirai, which is like, is directly from the Torah, and it means like, thou shalt not fear, right? This is what I was saying to this little boy. Now, I'm not saying translating it like, don't be afraid, because what I was doing was I was taking the Bible and speaking it in modern Israel. That's kind of like if I were walking around America speaking Shakespearean English, like, oh, thou. And so I was like, thou shalt not be afraid, I said to him. So I said that to him. And then another young woman, um, kind of around my age, I didn't know her, of course, but this is, this is family, right? You're in Israel. So she was like, you, you can't do that. He doesn't, he doesn't understand what you're saying. The, the language is too old. So that was that. Strangers giving advice because the whole country is a big family. And knowing that piece of culture really helped me navigate my journey there, right? I wasn't lost or bewildered. Gradually, I learned to be more mature about my, my joy. So these are <laughs> some examples of Jewish culture. But let's, let's go back to food, actually. How about that? All right, so why are we talking about food? Well, the Bible mentions food quite a lot, actually, in both the older and the Newer Testament. From the kosher laws in Leviticus to the fellowship issues at the table and problems with distribution of food to widows in the book of Acts. Also, food connects with what I call the three C's, covenant, calling, and culture. And I believe that these are helpful when thinking about ourselves, thinking about our mission, thinking about our congregation, and thinking about the Torah, thinking about the scriptures. So let's take a look once again at those. Number one is covenant. covenant. Number two is calling. calling. Number three, survey says culture. culture. It's up there. Good answer. Good answer. Okay. These three shape the why and the how of everything we do, and specifically what we do here at Tikvot Israel. The first two, I would say, are primary covenant and calling. Covenant is a binding promise or agreement between God and humans. And calling is vocation. It's related to identity. It is an assignment from God. The third one, culture, is not as weighty. It's not as, as important, but it is still helpful, as my experience in Israel indicates. But the trick is to figure out which one is going on when. And sometimes there are multiple ones going on. Professor Stanley Reeves at the University of Auburn defines culture in this way. I think this is helpful. Quote, culture is the secondary environment that man builds upon the creation comprising language, habits, ideas, beliefs, customs, social organization, inherited artifacts, technical processes, and values, unquote. Now, sometimes, as I said, these three C's are confused, and sometimes they overlap. So let's try to explore these one at a time. So let's take one example. One example is, why do we use Hebrew prayers in our service? You notice when you came here this morning, there was a lot of praying, and there was a lot of Hebrew. So why is that? Most of us aren't as familiar with Hebrew, where we might be learning it, but uh, we're, you know, whenever someone says to me, well, I tried this in Hebrew, but I couldn't quite get it right, I was like, I always say, well, you know, I, I do speak a little English. It's okay. You know, we can talk in English. But this is an important part of our community. Hebrew prayers are a part of Jewish faith and practice, and they are the expected behaviors of the culture of Jewish people. We want to be aware of Jewish culture here because we want to create Jewish space that is inviting to Jewish people. So that if a Jewish person comes through those doors or those doors, they would see that there is a way to worship Yeshua and remain Jewish. That's one of the reasons that we are here. It's not the only reason, but it's one of them. Jewish culture helps us to create Jewish space that is inviting to Jewish people. That's why I mentioned humor and behavior and other aspects of Jewish culture at the beginning of the sermon. Hebrew prayers are not just culture, though. Hebrew prayers are our calling. 
God called us, he gave us an assignment to be a synagogue. And a synagogue has Jewish space. A synagogue creates an environment that says following Yeshua and Jewishness go together. Finally, one can even argue that these prayers are related to covenant. As these prayers help us to fulfill the commandment to love the Lord our God with all our heart. Remember at the top of the service, I said these prayers and songs are vehicles for showing our worship, our love to the Lord. And loving the Lord is a commandment. It's part of our covenantal relationship with the Lord. So the Hebrew prayers are our culture and they are our calling that we can use as a vehicle for covenant. See how complex it can be? Therefore, some of the things that we do in our synagogue or in our lives may have more than one C attached to them. Let's now explore calling because we talked a lot about culture and food, right? Calling is related to identity and vocation or assignment. Congregations, we collectively have a calling and we as individuals have a calling or even multiple callings, something God has charged us and empowered us to do in this world. Some of my callings include, I am called to be a husband. I'm called to be a father. I'm called to be a rabbi. I'm called to do other things that God has shared with me in this community and the broader community. Moreover, my calling from God may shift over time. For a while, I felt a calling to work with children in the public school, and then the Lord shifted that. As a congregation, there was a time in the early years, in the 90s, where we had a Russian immigration services. That was our calling. It was right through there, this this entrance here. Our founding rabbi, Jamie Cowan, was an immigration lawyer as well as being a rabbi, and many of the Russians he helped out were Jewish, and so they ended up connected to our synagogue, so he was connecting the ministry to to helping them out. It was an outreach for a season based on Rabbi Jamie's calling that extended to the calling of the synagogue. Of course, we're not doing that now, but the Lord may have a different calling for a different season for us. As for covenant, covenant, as I said, is a promise between God and humans. Most of the covenants in the Bible are with the Jewish people. The most common one to come up over and over is the covenant at Mount Sinai for the Jewish people to keep the Torah, the commandments laid out in the first five books, mostly in Exodus, Leviticus, and Deuteronomy. So let's examine food. You want to go back to food? All right. I guess I guess I'm just hungry when I write these. Let's examine food through the lens of covenant, calling and culture in the scriptures. Let's go to the scriptures now. Why food? Well, food connects us. Food is how we fellowship. We break bread together in unity and relationship with one another. We notice that Yeshua broke bread with who? Those that were ignored those that were on the margins. And we are getting the chance to break bread together this afternoon for Oneg, after service. I hope to see you there. Sorry for the shameless plug, but you know, fellowship is key. So now, this is from this week's Torah portion, Shemini. I will quote from Leviticus 11. Notice the phrase that pops up. These are the food laws in Leviticus. Adonai said to Moshe and Aharon, tell the people of Israel, these are the living creatures which you may eat among the land animals. Any that has a separate hoof which is completely divided and chews the cud, these animals you may eat, but you are not to eat those that only chew the cud or have a separate hoof. For example, the camel, the coney, and the hare, the rabbit, are unclean for you because they chew the cud but don't have a separate hoof. While the pig is unclean for you, because although it has a separate, completely divided hoof, it does not chew the cud. You are not to eat meat from these or touch their carcasses. They are unclean for you. Whatever lacks fins and scales in the water is a detestable thing for you. The following creatures of the air are to be detestable for you. Specifically, of these you may eat the various kinds of locusts, grasshoppers, katydids, and crickets. But other than that, all winged, swarming creatures having four feet are a detestable thing for you. The following will make you unclean. Whoever touches the carcass of them will be unclean until evening. Whatever goes on its paws among all animals that go on all fours is unclean for you. Whoever touches its carcass will be unclean until evening, and whoever picks up its carcass is to wash his clothes and be unclean until evening. These are unclean for you. Everything on which any carcass part of theirs falls will become unclean, whether oven or stove. It is to be broken in pieces. They are unclean and will be unclean for you. And there's more like this, but I think that's enough examples. 
So what is the repeated phrase that you noticed over and over? Unclean, but there was two words after that, for you. It's unclean for you. Hmm. This is a phrase that comes out of covenant because God is speaking to Israel and it's Israel's promise to God. It doesn't mention anything here about the nations. So it is a specific covenant with a specific people. Sometimes we think about these animals as inherently or innately unclean, but that is not what the Torah says. It says it is unclean for Israel. Paul puts it this way when speaking of the Jewish people and the covenants in Romans 9, 1 through 5. I am speaking the truth as one who belongs to the Messiah. I do not lie, and also bearing witness is my conscience, governed by the Ruach HaKodesh. My grief is so great, the pain in my heart so constant, that I could wish myself actually under God's curse and separated from the Messiah. If it would help my brothers, my own flesh and blood, the people of Israel, they were made God's children. The Shekinah, that's the divine presence, has been with them. The covenants are theirs. The covenants are theirs. Likewise, the giving of the Torah, the temple service, and the promises, the patriarchs are theirs. And from them, as far as his physical descent is concerned, came the Messiah, who is over all. Praise be Adonai forever. Amen. Here, Paul is longing for his own people to know Messiah. And at the same time, he is stressing their connection to the covenants and identity by the grace of God. In other words, some of the behavior of a messianic synagogue, like we don't eat pork here, can be explained and taught as part of God's covenant with the Jewish people. Now this brings us to the second C, calling. There are some among the nations, Gentiles, that are called to come alongside the Jewish people. One great example of this is our own Messianic Jewish community and others like it. Calling is not something that is mandated by scripture. It is received by the Holy Spirit and confirmed through the scripture, godly counsel from trusted brothers and sisters in Messiah, words of encouragement, prayer, and circumstance. Nowhere in the Bible does it say that David Wine is called to be a rabbi. And the Lord spoke unto Moses saying, I couldn't find it. Nowhere in the Bible does it say that I had to marry my wife. Nowhere in the Bible does it say that I have to make cheesy jokes in every single sermon. (laughs) But here we are, right? I know the Lord has called me to do at least two of those things. (laughs) These were callings that I had to discern. And even though it wasn't in scripture, when I read the scriptures, they jumped out at me. That was confirmation. When I read about how David was a shepherd, a man after God's own heart, and also a leader, and I connected with him in the scriptures, I felt that the Lord was calling me. And it was also confirmed by others, right? I went to a conference and someone prayed for me and they said, I just see the word teacher all over you. She didn't know me from Adam. She had just met me. And the word in teacher in Hebrew is what? Rabbi. She was confirming my calling with a word of encouragement, a word of knowledge that I, had, I didn't know her. So callings are discerned and we read the scriptures and we, we get encouragement from others and confirmation and things like that. But it's not actually written in the scriptures, but it can be confirmed by the scriptures. Does that make sense? This is what I'm saying, okay? These are callings that we discern from God over time through prayer, counsel, and circumstance. Calling is a sense of vocation. It's part of one's identity. It's what we're supposed to be doing. It's an assignment from God. The Greek word in the Newer Testament has the word kaleo. It means to call, to invite, to give a name to, and to receive a name. I always thought that was interesting because that connects it to a piece of our identity. What was Ruth's calling? Her calling was to follow and be with her mother-in-law, Naomi, to abandon the false gods of Moab and to embrace the people of God and the people of Israel and the God of Israel. She embraced both of those. Here's how Rabbi Michael Rudolph sums up calling with respect to the food laws that we mentioned earlier. Rabbi Michael, by the way, is the associate rabbi at the congregation in our network in Northern Virginia called Ohev Yisrael. And he has written a guide to Torah observance on uh, the Tikkun America website. One note, uh, he uses the term Korove Yisrael to refer to Messianic Gentiles, that is, non-Jews who draw near to the Jewish people or part of a Messianic Jewish community. So this is from Rabbi Michael Rudolph. Quote, Scripture's reason for the food laws is clearly that Israelites, today called Jews, are a holy people set apart and are therefore commanded to a unique lifestyle, including restrictions as to what we are allowed to eat. 
so that we'll be seen as set apart. The reason is not temple dependent and is therefore as valid today as it was at the time the food commandments were given to Moses. Perhaps it is even more important today because so many of the world's Jews are integrated into the general society and have lost visibility. It is my opinion, therefore, that it is God's will that today's Jews and the Korove Yisrael, the Messianic Gentiles who dwell in community alongside us, continue to obey the biblically commanded restrictions on what may and may not be eaten. And that is a sin for us not to do so. So this, he's connecting it to covenant for Jews and to calling for, for Messianic Gentiles. How then should today's Gentile believers respond to the dietary commandments? Now he's talking, he's opening up more broadly to the, to the church of the world. Some say that they should not keep them because doing so will diminish Israel's visible uniqueness as a people set apart. Others say, if God gave these dietary restrictions to his chosen people, then they must be good, so I will adopt them as well. My opinion is that if Gentile believers voluntarily adhere to the biblical food laws as a witness to their grafted-in connection to the Jewish people, this is my comment, that's calling, they are acting appropriately. On the other hand, if they profess that the commandments are directed to all believers in Yeshua in order to mark them as holy people analogous to the Jews— and that they are in sin if they do not keep them, then they would be wrong, in my opinion, and would indeed be obscuring Israel's intended uniqueness. It is therefore my opinion that, in general, obedience to the food laws, other than those mentioned in Acts 15 by Gentiles, is optional, unquote. What he's saying is that for a Joe Christian out there, it's, it's optional, the Levitical laws, and for those that are in our community, that we are required to keep them, for Jews as covenant, and for non-Jews as calling. That's what he's saying, and, and I, I would agree with that based on my reading of the scriptures. Rabbi Michael believes that for the average Yeshua follower from the nations, the Christian out there, the food laws are optional. But for those that are part of the Mosaic covenant, the Jews, or those with a calling, Messianic Gentiles should keep the laws in Leviticus. One of our members, who may have a Jewish background, told me in his final interview to become a member, when he was younger, that he was reading through the book of Leviticus. And the words of the food laws leapt off the page into his heart, and he felt the Holy Spirit directing him to do that. He felt like the Lord said, I want you to do that. What is that? That is a calling based on confirmation from the scriptures and from the Holy Spirit. It's a beautiful calling. And this person became a member of Tikvat Israel. That's the place that he should be, right? Baruch Hashem. I thought it was really beautiful when he told me that. So we have turned the three C's inward to think about the why of our synagogue, the covenant, the calling, and the culture. And we've turned toward scripture to see the why of the food laws. So let's turn the three C's outward for the purpose of gospeling and discipleship and outreach. So let's take culture. 1 Corinthians 1.22 has this short statement. Jews ask for signs and Greeks try to find wisdom. So if this is still true, how can we use this information? Maybe we can make a sign for the Jews. Messiah this way, right hand of the Father, you know, pointing up. Is it that kind of sign? Maybe I'm a little off here. Man, my jokes are really... <laughs> I'm really walking in my calling by telling terrible jokes. I feel very affirmed by the blank stares. Like, what is he talking about, signs? A lot of the Jews that I know who came to faith in Yeshua, including myself, why did we do so? Because we saw God working in the lives of his followers. Would you say that's true, Eric? Absolutely, right? So it could just be even just the right word at the right time that could turn someone's heart to the Lord. So this little piece of wisdom that Jews look for signs, it's just a little cultural wisdom that I think is still even true even 2,000 years after it was written. And it may be that the culture has shifted and that Jews are looking for something else. And then we have to discern that. We have to be aware of the culture. These are not heavy things, but it's a good thing to be aware of. What is someone's culture so that you can be respectful and speak to them on their level? And it says Greeks try to find wisdom. Greek was a stand-in for Gentiles, for the nations, because most of them were Greek. So maybe that means that if someone in the present age is also into that. They're looking for wisdom. They're looking for apologetics. So we should be able to give a reason for the hope that is within us with reverence and humility. 
or it may work for someone and not work for someone else because not everyone follows into the exact same culture as the group. So it may depend on the Holy Spirit. But these are just helpful things. If we're aware of culture, then we have, we have a little piece of a gift that we can use to try to do outreach and discipleship and relational gospeling. What about calling and gospeling? When a Canaanite woman came to Yeshua in Matthew 15, what did he say? I was sent only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. My, he said, my calling is to my own people. And yet she persisted. And what did he do? He healed her daughter after she clung to him. Yeshua was expressing his calling to be primarily a teacher, healer to the Jewish people. But he wanted to show her it wasn't exclusive. This is a matter of calling. This is what the father sent Yeshua to do so that the Jewish people would bring the gospel like Paul to the nations. That was just the way that God had it. This is a matter of calling. But Yeshua also healed some Gentiles and he even praised their faith. He said things like, I haven't seen this faith even among Israel. And so he wanted to teach his students that God does indeed love everyone. It's not about that, but he also had a calling. He had an assignment to his own people. Paul's calling was exactly the opposite. His calling was to reach the nations. And so yet he always stopped at the synagogue every time he went out to preach the gospel. Did you notice that? Because God still has a special calling for Israel. So there's always exceptions to it. It's not an exclusive thing because God does love everyone. If you're a part of our community, then it is your calling in part to reach Jewish people. If you're here, if you're called to be here, you're called to reach Jewish people because that's what we're doing. This is something that we have to discern. Lord, are you calling me here? Is this my spiritual home? Am I called to pray and intercede for the Jewish people to know Messiah? Is this part of my vocation? Is this part of my identity? Like Yeshua and Paul, this calling though is not exclusive. We also need a heart for the nations. We need a heart for all people. We're not exclusive but we do have a calling. And that's what Yeshua said, that's what Paul said, and that's what we're saying. And finally, covenant. What is the great commission? The final commandment of Yeshua before he ascended into heaven was this, go therefore and make disciples of all nations. This is a covenantal obligation because it's a commandment. It's a commandment from the Lord. So are we discipling? What is our calling related to this covenant? He said, to his body of Messiah, go and make disciples of all nations. But he called Paul to go to the nations and he called Peter to go to Israel. So what has he called us to do? Are we discipling and mentoring Jewish people into their covenantal identity? Are we discipling all of our community into their calling? Calling is just as valid and beautiful as covenant and it needs to be respected because it is from God and it's a beautiful thing. It is an assignment from God to flourish his good world. So let's use the tools of covenant, calling, and culture to be fruitful and multiply, to share the good news, to mentor Jews and non-Jews into the fullness of their calling. Amen. Avinu, our Father, thank you for your faithfulness to us. Thank you that you are good and your mercy endures forever. We pray that you would help us to navigate covenant calling and culture in the things that we do in our synagogue and the things that we do in our lives and to really walk in our calling, to walk in the fullness of our assignment that you've given to us and to have it confirmed and to uh, pray and intercede for the Jewish people and for all nations to know you and help us to, to know our assignment here, Lord, and to be on the same page and to work together for your kingdom on earth. In Yeshua's name we pray, amen.